In this video, we'll look at the differences between nucleophilicity and basicity. These are important distinctions when you're trying to figure out elimination reactions versus substitution reactions, which we'll see in the next few videos. So let's first start with nucleophilicity. This refers to the rate at which a nucleophile attacks an electrophile. The stronger the nucleophile you have, the faster it will attack your electrophile. So this is an important concept to understand. And there are two factors to deal with uh, when you're trying to think about nucleophilic strength. The first one is charge. So let's compare two molecules here, and let's see which one of these two is the better nucleophile. So if I start over here and draw the ethoxide anion, right, it would look like that. And let's compare the ethoxide anion with the ethanol molecule, and let's see which one of these two is a better nucleophile. Well, on the right here, ethanol, this oxygen is partially negative, right? It's more electronegative than hydrogen over here, so hydrogen gets a partial positive, so we've seen that in earlier videos. So if an electrophile came along, so let me go ahead and draw a generic electrophile here that's positively charged. I think to myself, which one of these two molecules would be more attracted to the electrophile? The molecule with the full negative one formal charge or something with only a partial negative charge? And obviously it makes sense, the full negative one formal charge is more attracted to the electrophile. So this ethoxide anion would, would attack this electrophile faster than the molecule on the right, which means it's a stronger nucleophile. So let's go ahead and write that. So we're going to classify the ethoxide anion as a strong nucleophile. And relative to that, right, ethanol, ethanol would be a weak nucleophile here. So it's all about the rate of attack. There's another factor when you're trying to figure out the nucleophilicity of something, and that is the polarizability of your molecule. So let's look at that. Polarize, pol let's see, polarize ability. The ability of something to be polarized, usually due to external influences. All right, so let's let's look at an example of that. So let's once again let's let's use ethanol as our example. So I'm going to go ahead and draw ethanol here. I'll wait to put in the lone pairs of electrons, and I'm going to draw the sulfur analog of ethanol, which means just replace that oxygen with a sulfur here. Sulfur is in the same group as oxygen on the PRI table, so it's going to react in similar ways. And when I put in my lone pairs of electrons, I need to think now about the size of the atom. So we know that uh, sulfur is a larger atom than oxygen, right? So trends in the periodic table. So when I put in these lone pairs of electrons, I'm, I'm going to exaggerate where they are here. So the lone pair of electrons on oxygen are actually going to be closer to the oxygen nucleus, right? So I'm going to show them really close there to the oxygen nucleus. Whereas for sulfur, sulfur is a larger atom. And therefore, those electrons are a little bit further away from the nucleus, right? So I'm going to draw those lone pairs of electrons exaggerating here a little bit. So remember, your nucleus is positively charged, and electrons are negatively charged. So if those electrons are further away from the nucleus, right, the nucleus is going to have less of an effect on them, right? That's also physics, right? The, the larger distance between opposite charges, the less of an attraction that they have. So these electrons here uh, in sulfur are not quite as bound tightly to the nucleus. And if, a, if an electrophile came along, let's go ahead and draw our electrophile, our generic electrophile like this. Right, so positively charged, right? These electrons right here, these negatively charged electrons, right, are going to be attracted to the electrophile, and it's going to polarize this uh, this sulfur atom even more. So these electrons are better able to attack your electrophile. Whereas with oxygen on the on the right over here, those those electrons are held a little bit more closely to the positively charged oxygen nucleus, and those electrons aren't as as polarizable, right? You can't you can't get a huge polarity difference because those electrons can't can't go as far away from the nucleus as they can over here on the left. So so if we exaggerate this over here, right? So you have negatively charged electrons and your nucleus of your sulfur atom is positively charged. That's, that's where the polarization comes in. You get more of a polarization when your electrons are further away, allowing them to attack your electrophile. The same concept comes in with, with halogens, right? If I had a I've had the iodide anion here, right? It's a very large anion, and those electrons are further away from the nucleus, right? So iodide is also very polarizable, making it a strong nucleophile. So, so this thiol here is a strong nucleophile, and, and so is the iodide anion. And once again, ethanol is relatively weak. 
So let's let's look at basicity now. All right, so let's look at the basicity of something. So when you're trying to figure out basicity, it's pretty much just is something a strong or a weak base. And uh, one way to do that would be to check the pKa value. So check the pKa value of the conjugate acid. All right, so of the conjugate acid. So let's let's do an example really fast here. Let's say you wanted to figure out uh, whether the chloride anion was a strong or a weak base. Right, so Cl minus is that a strong or a weak base? One way to do it would be okay. What is the conjugate acid to the chloride anion? Just add a proton onto that, and you would get HCl. So once you have that, you can then look up your pKa values, right? So the pKa value for hydrochloric acid approximately negative seven. So we know the lower the pKa, the stronger the acid. So we know, of course, hydrochloric acid is a strong acid. And the stronger the acid, the weaker the conjugate base. So we know that chloride anion is relatively weak. Let's let's look at acid-base reaction just to just to prove that point. So if I were to react HCl, right, go ahead and put that in there with water, just so just a very simple general chemistry acid-base reaction. We know that hydrochloric acid is going to function as our acid. We know that water is going to function as our base. Water is going to take that proton, kick these electrons off, and we would form the hydronium ion, right, H3O plus. Right, and then we would also form the chloride anion like that. So if I wanted to think about, okay, now I have formed the chloride anion, what's the likelihood that this chloride anion would then take this proton to reform HCl? The answer is, of course, very low. Right, this does not happen. Chloride is not a strong base at all. So when you when you draw your arrows here, you're only going to draw the arrow going to the right. You don't need to draw any arrow going back to the left because this equilibrium pretty much lies all the way to the right because the Reverse reaction will not happen. So this just drives home the point that the stronger the acid, the weaker the conjugate base. Right? So we can classify the chloride anion as a weak base because it has a very strong conjugate acid. Let's look at ethoxide now. So if I wanted to figure out if the ethoxide anion is, is a strong or weak base, we would do the same thing. Right? We would go ahead and draw the ethoxide anion like that, make it negatively charged. and I would think about the conjugate acid. Just add a proton onto ethoxide, and you would form ethanol. So what is the pKa of ethanol? So it's approximately 16, which compared to hydrochloric acid up here, right? So hydrochloric acid with a pKa value of negative 7, this is very acidic. right? The lower your pKa value, the more acidic something is. So therefore, the higher the value for pKa, the less acidic something is. So pKa of 16 is 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 much much less acidic than than uh, than a pKa of something of negative seven. So ethanol, while it can function as an acid, it's a relatively weak acid compared to HCl. So if you have a relatively weak acid, you have a relatively strong base. So we can go ahead and say right now this ethoxide anion is a relatively strong base, and that's true for all alkoxide anions. They're relatively strong. So we've we've looked at nucleophilicity and basicity. Let's let's kind of summarize what we've learned in terms of nucleophilic strength and base strength and how something will will function. So let's look at let's look at things that will function as nucleophiles only. All right. So nucleophile only in a mechanism. Okay, so that means it's not a very good base. So something that's a poor, a, a weak base, but a strong nucleophile. The halogens fit into this category, right? So we, we talked about the fact that the chloride anion, right, this guy right here is a weak base, uh, but it's a strong nucleophile. It has all these lone pairs of electrons, has a negative one formal charge, so it can act as a strong nucleophile, right? The other halogens fit in that same category, right? Uh, bromide anion, right? The iodide anion, like that. We talked about the fact that iodide anion is a strong nucleophile because it's it's because it's easily polarized. Um, we talked about the fact that thiols are are strong nucleophiles as well, right? So if I were to write thiol in here, a generic thiol like that, right? 
polarizability, right? Same reason, uh, same reason why iodide is a strong nucleophile. Uh, this thiol here is a strong nucleophile. And if you uh, if you if you took SH minus, right? So analogous to the hydroxide anion, this is the hydrogen sulfide anion. This is also a strong nucleophile. And and your thiols are weak bases because the conjugate acids are relatively strong. So so these are the two main categories of things that will be nucleophiles only. All right, what will function only as a base? Uh, the hydride anion is the best example of this, right? It's negatively charged, something like sodium hydride here. So it's negatively charged. If it reacted with another proton, right, it wants to do that very, very badly, right? That would um, that would form H hydrogen gas. So, so that's a very that's a very favorable thing. So it will react as a base. It will not react as a nucleophile very well because of its size, right? It's very very small, which means that these electrons here, right? These electrons are close to the nucleus, right? To the positively charged nucleus, and uh, and that means it's not very polarizable. Okay, so so decreased pol it de it's decreased ability to be polarized. Right, which means it's not going to function very well as a nucleophile, but it can function as a base. So if something like sodium hydride was used in a reaction, it would function as a strong base, and you get an E2 reaction. Okay, so in the next two videos, we'll go into great detail about how to tell elimination versus substitution reactions, and, and that's why this video is so important. You have to be able to classify things as nucleophiles and bases. Some things can function as strong nucleophiles and strong bases, and we've seen an example of that already. Right? So let's look at strong nucleophile, strong base. The example that we've seen is the ethoxide anion. Right? So we've seen that the ethoxide anion can function as a strong nucleophile and as a strong base. So all alkoxides are in this category, right? So the generic alkoxide, RO minus, like that. And uh, hydroxide fits in this category as well, right? So OH minus, same idea, same idea. It can function as a strong nucleophile or a strong base. Weak nucleophile, weak nucleophile, weak base. All right, so something some, something that's not very good at either one. Well, if you if you protonate these molecules on the left, right? So if I if I protonate if I protonate the hydroxide anion right here, right? So if I protonate that guy, I'm going to form H2O. Right? So H2O. Water has lone pairs of electrons on this oxygen, so it can function as a nucleophile, right? We've seen that happen already, and it can function as a base, but it's not really great at either. Right, so uh, so so water is a weak nucleophile, weak base. If I protonate an alkoxide anion, right, take away that formal charge, form an alcohol. It's not as strong of, of a nucleophile. So we we've seen that already. It can function as a nucleophile because there's lone pairs of electrons, but it's not very strong. It can function as a as a base, but it's not a very strong base. Um, and 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 so these would be your two examples of weak nucleophiles, weak bases. So first you have to be able to classify something's a strong nucleophile or a weak nucleophile. And then you have to be able to classify something as a strong base or a weak base. And now you are ready to determine elimination versus substitution.